On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Starship is ready to fly again, DARPA has a plan for robots on the moon, and Japan launches their slim lunar lander. This is The Space Race. All eyes have been on Boca Chica as continued tests of the Starship and Super Heavy rocket at the SpaceX test launch facility have shown that the world's largest rocket is just about ready for a second shot at escaping the atmosphere. However, one big issue has been standing in the way, the FAA mishap investigation. But as luck would have it, on September 7th, the FAA messaged SpaceX to confirm that they had officially finished that process. So does that mean we're going to be seeing a launch this week? Maybe it's a bit complicated as usual. So let's go over a few things to clear the situation up. Mishap investigations are triggered when any one of a certain amount of criteria happen during a flight, and the April 20th test flight of Super Heavy ticked a lot of those boxes rather spectacularly, so the FAA definitely had to open a file. But mishap investigations aren't generally done by the FAA personally. They often rely on the company's internal reports to start, acting as observers. In this case, they even brought in NASA and the National Transportation Safety Board to cover all the bases. So when the mishap investigation was closed on September 7th, what the FAA was communicating was that the SpaceX-led investigation had been completed to the satisfaction of all three observers, which is very encouraging. Of course, the whole point of an investigation like this is to make sure that the inciting mishap doesn't happen again, so everyone was expecting a list of required changes to Starship that SpaceX would have to complete before being given the go-ahead to launch again, and that's exactly what we saw. By the time news of the investigation's wrap-up had started circulating, we also got news of a list of the 63 individual changes that SpaceX had to complete. The list had been modified to use more generic language in order to keep some proprietary technology under wraps, but they mostly revolve around things like changing connector types and redesigning the fire suppression system. On that note, we did get a little bit more information from a rare update on the SpaceX site itself. The redesign of the fire suppression system, for instance, was one of the huge changes as apparently the biggest cause for the loss of the vehicle on April 20th was that a fuel leak in the engine bay of the booster had severed the connections to the flight computer, causing the loss of several engines and, of course, those dramatic loops. And it's not a coincidence that the SpaceX statement says that they've already fixed one of the more major line items in the FAA list. It's because SpaceX made that list. Remember, this whole investigation was being completed by the company itself, while the FAA, NASA, and the NTSB all watched. The repairs being done to the ship's structure, the changes to its plumbing, the electrical gimbling for the Raptor engines, and the testing for the improved flight termination system were all completed while liaising with the overseeing administrations. Which means that SpaceX is just about finished with the whole 63-point list, and that's not even including the upgrades not mentioned as requirements for flight like the new deluge system or the hot staging vent on the booster. Now, some of you may have noticed we said just about finished back there, and that's because of some communications from the FAA to the fine folks at NASA Spaceflight. In searching for some clarity as to how long it would take for SpaceX to gain the modification to their license that would allow them to launch again, NASA Spaceflight's John Galloway received this answer, quote, The time frame to evaluate a license modification application from submission to final determination will vary it is based on the operator submitting a complete application. So, just like with the investigation itself, the FAA isn't steering the ship here, SpaceX is. We can assume from recent events that SpaceX would post about their application being sent, like they did when they handed in their investigation report to the FAA on August 21st. The fact that they haven't means that they likely didn't apply for the license to launch, which could mean that they haven't quite finished all of those 63 items yet. Now, of course, this is making some assumptions. SpaceX is working very quickly here, and so it is also possible that they simply hadn't posted about their application, or that they just hadn't applied before the end of the work week, and were going to do that on Monday. Who knows, bureaucracy is hard to predict sometimes. But local notices to mariners on August 16th 
showed that SpaceX had warned the Coast Guard of potential spaceflight activities on August 31st and then again on September 8th through the 13th. These dates can change and shift, but with the Starship getting a full stack and the FAA closing the mishap investigation, it sure looks like we could see a launch much sooner than we all thought. We'll know within the next few days as keeping the full weight of a stacked Starship on the OLM for long periods of time is unwise to say the least. Either SpaceX will de-stack the vehicle this week for repairs and launch preparations, or we're going to see a launch. The race to build a fully self-sustaining lunar colony is on and NASA just got a new ally, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. On August 15th, DARPA, those folks that make the robot dogs, bipedal robots, and drones for the military announced that they were seeking partners with developers interested in starting a 10-year project on the moon. The first phase of this plan called Luna 10 would be to gather companies who want to develop essential infrastructure like communications, navigation, water, sewage, and of course power, and develop a plan to pull them all together for a 10-year project that will take NASA's first landings and turn them into a fully self-sufficient, permanent colony inside of a decade. And early studies have already been happening. Just after the April 18th Space Symposium, DARPA reportedly approached NASA to offer their help. They sat down with the Space Administration and went over their roadmap to Mars and outlined the areas that they thought DARPA was best suited to help. Obviously, this is more than just a chance to help NASA get a lunar colony up and running more efficiently. DARPA is a defense contractor and developing for spaceborne applications to other more militaristic problems is exactly the opportunity that DARPA hopes to exploit with this study. Moon-based communications and navigation equipment could definitely help the military, so DARPA considers this a good investment. Plus, their expertise with automated systems means that they get to design and test robotic construction solutions, which has a much wider ranging application than just defense. The company is planning on getting an 80% completed study to present to the next Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium on April 26, 2024. By then, they expect to have the bulk of a plan to start constructing the infrastructure needed for a colony by 2035, when NASA plans to be sending regular missions to the surface and then complete the whole project in just 10 years. DARPA doesn't mess around. JAXA is on its way to the moon. On September 7th, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency launched their lunar mission on top of an H-2A rocket. On board was an X-ray telescope meant to search for black hole particles and a 700-kilogram experimental lunar lander named SLIM. The smart lander for investigating Moon has been nicknamed the Moon Sniper because its mission is extremely specific to land not just in a space that's convenient, but in a space that the ground crew chooses. Think back to some recent lunar landers. India's Chandrayaan-3 was successful, but their previous lander was not. Russia's Luna 25 made a cool new crater instead of touching down safely. And even Japan's two most recent attempts, the Omotenashi and iSpace Akuto R, both failed to make it to the lunar surface in a controlled manner. And that's not just because of some calculation errors either. Landing on the moon is incredibly difficult. Signal lag alone would make it hard, but we are trying to land vehicles on a world over 360,000 kilometers away with rough surfaces littered with boulders and crevices that we can barely see. This forces us to land in areas where we think could be mostly flat instead of areas that are closer to the things we want to study, and JAXA wants to fix that. SLIM's primary goal is to get to the moon and make a high accuracy landing, aiming to set down in an area defined within just 100 meters. For reference, when Apollo 11 was sent to the moon, its landing area was projected across 20 kilometers, and Armstrong still had to take over and land manually. SLIM's level of accuracy is mind-boggling. Of course, JAXA couldn't resist the opportunity to collect more data, so two rovers are also hitching a ride on board SLIM, and they will both be taking measurements and testing their mobility. Lunar Excursion Vehicle 2 was originally meant to land with the doomed Hakuto R lander and is a rover that can reportedly change its shape to allow for better mobility. But while important, those tests are nothing compared to landing with the precision that SLIM is trying to test. If successful, JAXA's new rover will change everything about landing on the moon and possibly other bodies too. 
although this is really only possible because of the network of mapping and navigation satellites already in orbit around the moon. But hey, if that's what it takes to get a bullseye landing, then this mission should also prove the usefulness of setting up a network of satellites over a potential landing spot. Two proofs with one mission. Not bad at all, JAXA. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.